remind you that our growth group starts again <clears throat> this Wednesday at 6.30, potluck, Mexican food. So if you haven't come to our midweek study where we talk about the message, discuss it, apply it to our lives, want to encourage you to come. It's right there in the living room, right behind the partition. So we encourage everyone to come. So again, God bless you this morning. So glad to be here. Uh, this is going to be part two of my New Year's message. I was hoping to finish it last week, but unfortunately was not able to do that. So that's what we'll have today. We will finish that today, and it's called Take One Step from 2 Peter 3.18. Uh, Jonathan Edwards is considered the greatest American theologian of all time. His renown comes from preaching the most famous hellfire and brimstone sermon ever preached, and that's called Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. The other thing he's known for is his 70 resolutions covering everything from his overall life mission, time management, relationships, suffering, and spiritual life. Can you imagine 70 resolutions? Not one, not two for the new year, but 70. This guy was a serious man of God. I want you to listen to his first resolution out of those 70. He said this, Resolved that I will do whatsoever I think to be most to God's glory and my own good, profit, and pleasure in the whole of my duration without any consideration of the time, whether now or never so, many myriads of ages hence, resolve to do whatever I think to be my duty and most for the good and advantage of mankind in general, resolve to do this, whatever difficulties I meet with, how many and how great soever. Man! You got to think about that one a while, don't you? In other words, his whole life, his whole being is going to be live for the glory of God. Everything he does. His 41st resolution, he said, resolve to ask myself at the end of every day, week, month, and year, wherein I could possibly in any respect have done better. <laughs> okay? That's not a bad resolution. Ask how we could have done better. Number 10, resolve when I feel pain to think of the pains of martyrdom and of hell. Huh. Well, that's really redeeming to the time when we have to suffer. Two more. Number 20, resolve to maintain the strictest temperance in eating and drinking. I don't think you'd invite Jonathan Edwards out for a beer in a movie. Number 48, resolved constantly with the utmost niceness and diligence and the strictest scrutiny to be looking into the state of my soul that I may know whether I have truly an interest in Christ or no, that when I come to die, I may not have any negligence respecting this to repent of. You can see he was serious, was he not? He was a man who was absolutely committed to serving the Savior no matter the cost. And the fruit of his life is such that he has generation after generation of people who have served in government in, in America over the next hundred years after his life. So it's pretty amazing. Now, not only that, but there's 65 more of those resolutions. I will spare you those. You can Google them if you'd like to. But he also resolved to remember to read over these resolutions once a week, <laughs> okay, so we wouldn't forget those deep, heavy resolutions he remembered to read over once a week. Well, when we last meet, met, I asked you to consider making two resolutions. The first was based on Matthew 6, 33. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. It's in the context of worry, the things that you worry, the things that you're, where you're going to eat, what you're going to wear, where you're going to live. Jesus says, don't worry about any of these things, but seek me first. Seek me first and seek how to live your life in me. And all of these will be taken care of. I have found that to be absolutely true. Have you? Have you found that to be true? Hasn't God provided everything you need so far? And he will continue. That's his promise. So here's the resolution that came from that. Number one, have a daily quiet time. That's it. Have a daily quiet time. And I reposted, reprinted my notes again with how to have, if you're not having a daily quiet time, I show you in your notes how to have a 10-minute quiet time.
quiet time. 10 minutes. 10 minutes to start. 30 seconds, one minute to prepare yourself, six minutes to read the word, and two minutes to just talk to God. It's very simple. And you'll find if you develop this pattern day after day, 10 minutes is not nearly enough. You will find you need more and more time. And that's a good thing to do, which means you have to get up earlier and earlier to spend time with him. But that's it. Please take those notes home today. Don't put them in the recyclable. Take it with you because I also put in there how heads of households can have a time with their family as well. How you can pray first for you and your time, then with your kids, and then with your spouse. I highly recommend it. Let me ask you, do you ever have a time of stillness with God? To enjoy him, to think about him, to talk to him. Do you let him talk to you through his word? That's how God speaks primarily, is through his word, the Bible. He doesn't go by feelings and not too many times through dreams. I've never had a vision. And anything that I thought that God may have inspired me to do has been based on his word, based on his word. Charles Spurgeon said, if we are weak in communion with God, we are weak everywhere. And that makes sense. If we're a Christian, Jesus should be our very lives. If we say we love God, we must love his word. We cannot separate the two. We can't love God and be apathetic towards this. The writer of Psalm 119 was not apathetic about God's word. In fact, the entire psalm, if you've ever read it, is a love letter to God's word. Psalm 119. Listen to how much he loves it. Verse 97, oh, how I love your law. Verse 16, I will delight in your statutes. Verse 20, my soul is consumed with longing for your rules at all times. Verse 41, let your steadfast love come to me, O Lord. The law of your mouth is better to me than thousands of gold and silver pieces. That's verse 72. Verse 129, your testimonies are wonderful. Verse 171, my lips will pour forth praise for you teach me your statutes. And lastly, Psalm 119, 15, I meditate on your precepts and consider your ways. Do you? Do you do that? Do you read his word? Do you meditate on his word? Do you talk to God? Do you let him talk to you? And then go forward to try to live it out, to live it out. This is the very basis of being a, a believer in Jesus. The best way to seek first Jesus' kingdom and righteousness is to meditate on his word. That is how we can know we are in him and he is in us. If you've sinned too much the day before, or even a little, you can come before him with the great confidence that he forgives, that he forgives. When we meditate on him, we reflect on who he is, his nature, his gentleness, his humility, his grace, his forgiveness. We ask ourselves, then how will I live today? Will I live for Jesus or for myself? That's the bottom line of all of this, of truly living for him. I believe this stuff. I believe this stuff. He has been so faithful to me, and he is faithful to you. But it's even amazing, more amazing, when you see how faithful he is and what he, what he is capable of doing. John 15, 5 through 7, Jesus says this, I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Is that your desire, to bear much fruit for his kingdom? To bear much fruit? To see people listen to you, to offer them wise counsel on how their lives... People's lives are messed up, have you noticed? People's lives are messed up. We have the answer, and it really is the answer. But it takes time, it takes discipline, it takes courage. He says, if you do not remain in me... Well, it says, apart from me, you can do nothing, nothing of lasting value. If you do not remain in me, Jesus says, you are like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up, thrown into the fire and burned. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. He's not talking about hell there. He's saying that whatever you do, if it isn't based on him, it's just, gonna, it's just like something being burned up. It's not going to make any difference whatsoever. So if you want to bear much fruit and have your prayers answered, love God's word and meditate on it. There's a couple of ways you can go approach God's words. You can do that 10-minute thing to get it out of the way, right? Okay, I'm going to read it. I got my reading out of the way. You put your Bible down, and then you just do everything you would have normally done anyways if you hadn't read the word. Or you can read the word, think about it, and he'll speak to you through one or two verses if you're reading. And then how are you going to apply that? What, will, what is he telling you to do, and how will you use that? 
Spurgeon says, it is blessed to eat into the very soul of the Bible until at last your blood is biblin and the very essence of the Bible flows from you. He's saying you read it so much, you bleed the Bible. You overflow with it. Your very soul is consumed with his word. So you cut your veins open and out comes the word. I love that. So it's not too late, by the way, to make that resolution. It's January 16th, but the cool thing about resolutions is this. You can make them anytime. You can resolve today that you're going to have that 10-minute quiet time starting today. It doesn't have to be in the morning, though I prefer and I think it's best, but you can start tomorrow even. Not too late. Jonathan Edwards' 28th resolution was this, resolve to study the scriptures so steadily, constantly and frequently, as that I may find and plainly perceive myself to grow in the knowledge of the same. So he wants to study so completely the scriptures that he sees himself growing. To me this year about something that I'm not going to tell you what he said to me, because it's just between he and I, but I get to live it out every day. And I'm being tested in it in many different ways. But it's great when he, what I believe he spoke to me about because I'm going to see what the fruit of that is going to be at the end of the year. And no, I'm not going to tell you. You can pray. Maybe God will tell you, but I doubt it. He has, he has you to worry about, right? He'll tell you what you need to do. Which brings us to the second resolution. The first resolution is what? Have a daily quiet time. Spend some time with the Lord. Is 10 minutes too much, do you think? No, 10 minutes isn't too much. Start there, and you'll be amazed how that time just starts growing and growing. It's amazing. So I have the daily quiet time. The second resolution comes from 2 Peter 3.18. But grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To him be glory both now and forever. Amen. Grow in the grace and knowledge of the Lord. That's a command. There's a Mexican salamander called the axolotl. Axolotl, it's a weird spelling, which is a biological enigma. Instead of maturing into adult form, it retains a tadpole-like characteristic throughout its entire life. Writers and philosophers have used the axolotl as a symbol of someone who fears growth. I think we have a lot of Christians who are exogolatools. <laughs> I, have to, I had to phonetically put it out here. Axolatol. Isn't that amazing? It retains, it retains its infant baby stage forever. We don't want to do that as Christians, do we? No, you don't want to be a baby Christian when you're 30 years old. You want to grow. You can read God's word and meditate it meditate on it every day but here's the thing if you don't put it into practice you're not going to grow you can read it but if you don't put it into practice it's like eating potato well no it's better than eating potatoes but it's like it's like not doing any physical exercise so your body can be healthy as well but this is for the soul and James says the same thing. He says, do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. Anyone who listens to the word but does not do what it says is like someone who looks at his face in a mirror and after looking at himself goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. But whoever looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom and continues in it, not forgetting what they have heard but doing it, they will be blessed in what they do. So, spend time in the Word and put it into practice. Whether you're listening to the Word preached here or meditating on it alone, the bottom line is this, just do it. Just do it. So the second resolution I'd like you to make is this. Take one step. Let me hear you go, ooh, no, pastor. No, come on, no, that's too much. Take one step. I'm not saying five steps. I'm not saying write 70 resolutions and keep them. I'm saying have that quiet time and take one step. Well, what does that mean? Take one step. How? How? Where? Where am I taking this step? Well, I'd like you to take one step from whatever 
circle you're in right now. Have you ever heard of the concentric circles of Christian commitment? Concentric circles of Christian, show that up there on the screen. That's them. I'd like you to take one step from whatever circle you are in right now so that you can grow. So let me explain what each of these circles mean. I want you to decide what circle you're in, and then I'll give you a little one step to do. Okay? The first circle is on the outside. That's community. The community is made up of everyone we have the potential to reach on any given Sunday. They live near our church. They're aware of our church's existence. They may even visit occasionally. But for the most part, they're unchurched. And they most likely haven't decided to follow Jesus yet. If this is you, then I want you to take one step into the crowd. Into the crowd. Okay, who's the crowd? Well, the crowd consists of all the people who attend our church on a regular basis. Perhaps once or twice a month, but not much more involved beyond that. If that's you, take one step into the congregation. Into the congregation. What's the congregation? Well, the congregation is you attend regularly, you give regularly, you support the vision and values of our church. If that's you, take one step and Become a member. Become a member. That's the committed. That's the committed. The committed are those who have become members. They are growing in their relationship with Jesus and are establishing the habits and disciplines of a disciple. They walk with God. They're growing spiritually. And when you are a member, there are certain commitments we are asking you to make to your church. And when you make those commitments, there are certain commitments that I make and the elders make to you. When I asked some other pastors in our association about what their membership is, how do they describe it, they said it very simply, two of the men. They said, well, being a member lets us know who we need to go run after if you leave, that, that you're part of us. Now, I'm, we're so small that I'm going to run after you even if you're not a member because I love you anyway. But in a larger fellowship where you get hundreds and hundreds of people, you don't really know who's really committed. But there's a commitment you make to our church. There's a commitment we make to you. We have a membership class coming up in February. If you'd like to see the form, they're just right over by the coffee pot. You can see what we require. Now, if you're already a member, then take one step towards the core. The core are those who get involved serve others through the ministries of the church. We have a lot of things to get involved in. You heard one of those needs is we need children's church workers. I hate that Casey can't be here every week, but if the children's church worker isn't here today, she has to go back there. I'd like us, basically a children's church worker once a month is the commitment. Half an hour, one half hour a month, that's all we're asking. But there's many other things that you can be involved in. We have a lot of things, and God may even have a special vision just for you. I met with a man on Friday, and he said, you know, the reason why we're coming to this church now is because we want to preach the gospel. God is telling me I need to go out there and I need to preach the gospel. So I have an idea for a ministry for him over the course of time. I don't want to scare him away yet, but I'm going to let him know what, what I believe God may have for him if that's what he wants to do. I think that's great that God put that on his heart. If you're a member of the core, then I would like you to take one step to become the commissioned. Well, what are the commissioned? Well, the big goal for moving people from community all the way to the commissioned is, or to the core, and ultimately to send them back, is ultimately to send you back out again into the community. So send back out to the community you can bring those people in the community back here into church. I understand Logan invited two of his friends here to church today, right? Glad you're here. Welcome. Good job, Logan. Good job. That's it. Logan's going into the community. By the way, Logan also put stickers on the back of my trillion of our trillion dollar bills. Logan's behind the camera. Man, that guy's serving, isn't he? But isn't it great? To just be involved in that way? 
When people are committed, growing, and serving, then we prepare them to be sent out on a mission. Might just be our local community. Might be on the local chamber of commerce. They are then commissioned. These include those who are leaders within the church, pastors, elders, ministry leaders, too. Missionaries. We don't have any missionaries yet sent from our church. Who has a call to go to Africa? Jerry Lee? No, I'm kidding. <laughs> Is that everyone's fear when they become a Christian that they're going to become a missionary to Africa? That was my biggest fear. Here's the good thing about this is that no one gets sent to Africa until God prepares your heart to be sent to Africa. He doesn't kick you out and send you screaming and crying to Africa. No, he gives you a burning desire to do that. A burning desire to do that. If you're part of the commission, then what do you do now? Well, stay faithful and ask God how you can serve him even more faithfully. Does that make sense? So I'm asking you to have a daily quiet time of 10 minutes or more and take one step. Where are you in that concentric circles of Christian, I don't even know what I named it, that. <laughs> Community, crowd, congregation, committed core commission, where are you? Just take one step, one step. Our goal isn't church growth. Did you know that? Our goal is church health. And when everyone's involved, when everyone's serving, our church gets healthy. I did statistics. Um, Molly and I were talking about all the people who have served in the last year. What percentage do you think of our church has served in our church? Holler it out. What do you think? Huh? 30. 30. Huh? 69%. You know the average church is 20%, right? They say 20% of the church does 80% of the work. With 69% of the people have served. Let's get to 100. So there's room. There's room to grow. We want to help you. We want to help move you from where you are to where God wants you to be in your spiritual journey. That's the reasons for our ministries, for our midweek Bible studies, for our women's studies, for our worship team, for our media team. You guys still need volunteers, right? Yep, it, Ryan, they've been praying for years. Years. And we've only had that booth for a year and a half. But they've been praying for years. They could use you up there. And Ephesians 4 says this. So Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors and teachers. Why did he give those gifts to the church? To equip his people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith. So he gave the various giftings of the church to equip you to serve the church. Why? So that the entire body may reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. So he wants us to be mature. You become mature when you serve. You become mature when you get involved. You become mature. When you start on a path of, to maturity when you take that one step. I'm going to close with this. Jonathan Edwards resolved to do just that in his 30th resolution. He said this, resolved to strive to my utmost every week to be brought higher in my faith and do a higher exercise of grace than I was the week before. Wow, it's pretty amazing. Do you want to be better next week than you were this week in Christ? That's a good start. Have that quiet time, take one step. In this new year, 2022, wouldn't you like to go farther than you have ever gone before with God? I hope the answer to that is yes. Let's pray. Lord God, we thank you that you didn't just save us and leave us on the, the doorstep of the world unattended and uncared for. No, you saved us for a purpose. You saved us so that we might make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything you've commanded us. Commanded. You've also saved us, Lord God, so that we might preach the gospel, preach the gospel to all creation. 
You saved us also so that we might love one another so they would see Christ in us. You saved us so we can be the light of the world because we are the light of the world. We are the salt of the earth. Jesus said that. Jesus says, let your light so shine before people that they may see your good works and praise your Father in heaven. Oh God, wouldn't that be awesome if people in our community would praise you because of us, because of them knowing us. Oh, they go to Community Church of the Hills. Oh, they know their Jesus. Help us, Lord, not to just ignore this, forget about this, but let us start with the families. Each household has a home, has a leader, whether it's a single mom, whether it's a married couple, let them lead their family in the ways of righteousness, Lord. Let them lead them in the way they should go. Let their spouses know that they are loved and cared for, first of all, by you, as demonstrated by their spouse's love towards them. Thank you, God, for all you've done. Yes, there's many resolutions we make every year, but truly seeking you first and growing in the grace and knowledge of you is the most important thing we can do. We know that you will empower us to do it by your Holy Spirit. We trust that you will, and we thank you that you, that you do do that. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.